My husband Paul and I have been very fortunate in that we've been able to travel outside the United States. And when our children were in elementary school still, they were probably eight and 10, we were invited to visit his brother who lives south of London. And during that trip, we took a side trip to Paris and we had a wonderful time in Paris. And while we were there, we visited this little park at the foot of the Eiffel Tower and we bought, we, we went to a little kiosk and we bought some baguette and some cheese, a bottle of wine, some water, and it was a beautiful day. We had a picnic, we had a lovely time, we were just enjoying being in Paris. But all of a sudden there was this kerfuffle, something was happening and over at the kiosk. And there was a woman there who was trying to communicate with the proprietor of the kiosk, but she didn't speak a lick of French. She was trying to get something, and she couldn't communicate it to him, and he could not understand what she was saying. He was trying, gesticulating, doing all kinds of things to try to get, get, get it, but he just couldn't. And when she wasn't getting what she wanted, you know what happened. She got louder and louder and louder. Finally, when that didn't work, she turned around and had her back toward the kiosk and yelled out at the park, and I am not kidding you, does anyone here speak French? <laughs> we were in Paris. Everyone spoke French. Our poor children were aghast. We felt bad for the poor kiosk owner. And I, you know, I have this, this much high school French and was able to get us around Paris on that. But I have to admit, I wasn't about to help her. I was not about to go to the aid of that ugly American. I, I remember this incident when I was reading the story of Jesus and Nicodemus talking to each other. Nicodemus and Jesus seem to be talking past each other, even though they're conversing in the same language, sort of. Nicodemus could not seem to get what Jesus was saying, and Jesus could not understand why dear Nicodemus couldn't get outside of his box. Some have criticized Jesus for his seemingly frustrated response to Nicodemus when he said, you're a respected teacher of Israel, and you don't know the basics? but I prefer to think that Jesus was sort of exercising a little bit of rabbinic irony here. He might have been saying this with a smile on his face and a glint in his eye, trying to get Nicodemus, that old boy, to hook into what he was saying, to help him have an aha moment. What we seem to have in this exchange between a law and order, old school, systematic theologian, and Jesus the visionary, the mystic, is a classic example of two people not understanding a bit what the other is talking about. Jesus was being, talking about being born again or born from above, which Nicodemus found rightly to be ridiculous. Grown man could no more climb back into his mother's womb and come out again than, well, a dead person could be brought back to life. And of course, Jesus wouldn't understand how a learned man could not understand his powerful metaphor. Nicodemus gets credit from me. He may have gone to Jesus in the dark of night so as not to be seen by his fellow Pharisees, but he did go. He may not have understood what Jesus was saying, but he had the humility, or maybe the chutzpah, to ask questions of this new kid on the block. And he did it all right after Jesus had been on a rampage at the temple, turning over tables. Would you do that? Would you go ask Jesus questions? Would I? Would I have sought out someone who had just indicted the way I practice my religion? usually wither in the face of criticism. I don't go back for more. Nicodemus had the humility to seek out Jesus, to find out what he was all about. And what Jesus said to Nicodemus about being born from above or born again or born anew merits some investigation. 
Now you've all seen those people at ballparks that hold up John 3.16 whenever the, the camera comes on them. We often hear this particular verse in the context of so-called born-again Christians. And often the verse is used to pass judgment on people. Have you been born again? Often signifies a walk down a very evangelical road that many of us would rather not try. But when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about the need to be reborn, his metaphorical language did not stop as he continued to speak about the movement of the Spirit. Jesus was pushing Nicodemus to see that new life constantly emerges from the old, that the Spirit moves over all of us as she will from above, like a wind that blows through this way and that, invisible but palpable. The Spirit helps us be born from above, not knowing exactly where we will be headed next. And when that movement, when that new life happens, God interrupts our old lives and our old habits, equipping us with new life and new habits, some of which we could never have previously imagined. Those are aha moments, just like Hans. Aha, I get it. Being born from above, being born anew, being born again, in this context, does not mean some emotional lightning strike that once having happened means we can talk about our salvation in the past tense. Jesus continually pushes us to have aha moments, moments when we see the world anew, living life constantly in the presence of God, anticipating the movement of the Spirit, learning that we are never fully formed in our faith or our knowledge of God. A couple of years ago, I read Debbie Irving's powerful book, Waking Up White and Finding Myself in the Story of Race. I commend it to you. The book is a compelling account of how Ms. Irving learned and continues to learn to see the world differently from how she was brought up to see the world. She recounts her story of coming to understand her role in race and racism in the United States. She relates how she grew from understanding herself as not a racist but a good person to understanding herself as a cog in a larger system that supports white privilege and promotes racial inequality. The book is the unpacking of her aha moments as she begins waking up to see how she herself is a part of the racial divide in this country. And as she wakes up, she recounts her efforts to undo her socialization, to make the transformation from ignorance about her whiteness to awareness of what she can be. And for Ms. Irving, the process continues as she continues to learn. If this subject makes you uncomfortable, welcome to the club. The issues of race and racism in our country have not gone away with the abolition of slavery, mandates of affirmative action or the outlawing of discrimination, and we continue in this society to battle the long, long legacy of the enslavement of African peoples. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to go to a conference on white privilege. And I can remember thinking, really? Do I really want to go to a place where I'm going to start feeling more guilty than I already do? Really? Why would I want to spend money on something like that? Why would anyone want to do that to themselves? After reading Waking Up White, I had an aha moment. As a follower of Jesus Christ, it is my responsibility to understand how my actions and my inactions affect other people. If I hide myself in my white neighborhood, in my white church, and I do not understand how people of color experience life differently from me, how they do not have the same opportunities as me, I am not fulfilling my high calling as a disciple of Christ because I am not doing anything to make things new. So this year, again, I had the opportunity to attend a white privilege conference. And I did. It was in Cedar Rapids. There were 2,000 people there. About 
60% white and 40% people of color. And while I was uncomfortable much of the time, I learned to look at the world in a more nuanced way. I'm beginning to understand why people of color in the US cannot, despite their best efforts, lift themselves out of poverty. Because the deck, the whole system is stacked against them. And then I have learned to ask myself what I can do about it. Don't just feel guilty, Barbara. What can you do? How can I intervene in helpful ways? How can I see things differently and do things differently and be differently in the world? How can I intervene? interrupt this system. I'm not there yet. I will never be there. I know it. But I also know that I will never see black and white issues in this country the same way, and that is a good thing. It's a Christian thing. Jesus asks Nicodemus to see the world differently, different from his laced-up Pharisaic theology, to be born from above, to have an aha moment, to let the Spirit move him as it will. Similarly, Jesus asks us to see the world differently from our laced up Presbyterian theology. Jesus asks us to be born from above, to have not one, but many aha moments as we participate in building the realm of God on earth. Being born from above, or again, or anew, is not something we check off our to-do list. It is a lifelong process of participation in waking, learning, and <coughs> seeking. The Spirit, and only the Spirit can do this, the Spirit has moved me to understand gender inequality differently, issues of immigration differently, issues of sexuality differently, problems of racism differently, to name just a few of the aha moments that I have had in my life with Christ. And these experiences were not one and done events. They were the beginning of a new life in Christ as I began the process of awakening and learning and seeking. It has never been easy to see the world anew. Sometimes it entails a very close look at myself and my own participation in systems that, that place people in oppression. And I am still learning every day, every minute, every second, because I love Jesus and I want to follow him daily. I am certain that the Spirit has led many of you to understand the world differently by your own being born from above, by your own being moved by the Spirit. In chapter 3 of John's Good News, we don't hear much from Nicodemus after he asks, what do you mean by these things? How can this happen? But later in the gospel, you know what? We find Nicodemus defending Jesus to the Pharisees. And finally, we find Nicodemus appearing after the crucifixion of Jesus, assisting Joseph of Arimathea in preparing the body of Jesus for burial. We don't know if, Jesus, if Nicodemus had an aha moment because it's not documented anywhere. But I like to think that Jesus got Nicodemus to thinking and praying and acting, and that in the end, Nicodemus became a follower of Jesus, letting the Spirit take him where she would, and that he began the lifelong awakening that it is to be a follower, a disciple of Christ. So, my new friends, let Nicodemus be an example for all of us as we seek to live into this Christ-like life. Think on these things. <laughs>